Hi there. If I told you you had a story to tell, would you share it? Better yet, if you knew you could help someone else, would you tell it? Hi, I'm Christine Hatchis, and just like our fingerprints, I believe our stories are unique to every avenue in our life and put us on the path that we are on. Would you agree? I would certainly agree with that. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Thank you. Today, my guest is Dr. Lester, and let me give you a little information about it as to who he is. Dr. Lester is a foundation professor of English and founding director of Project Humanities at here, Arizona State University, also known as ASU. And that would be the um, Sun Devils? As Sun Devils, absolutely, and the largest research institution in the country. I figured there would be more energy yes. behind yes. it, but yes. anyone who's an ASU fan would be like, what do you mean? So yes. stop, please yes. say it. Yes, yes. All right. Dr. Lester is the author and or co-editor of eight, mm -hmm. eight scholarly books and grounds his research in the study of African-American literature and culture. Both Dr. Lester and the Project Humanities University Innovative, Innovative have received local, national, and international accolades for work in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm taken back by all that. So I know Dr. Lester because of the work that you do here in the community yes. in uh, Chandler, Arizona, Mesa, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, Phoenix, Phoenix, every we, area yeah. that you can yes. go and, yes. and help. Yes, Avondale, um, Peoria. So tell me a little bit about yourself as to um, who Dr. Lester really is besides what I just let our audience know. Well, um, you know, I could I could start back with where I grew up. Um, but but I'll I'll refrain from that since that's a long story. I guess where who Dr. Lester is, I think, is who Dr. Lester has met, and who has sort of helped me along the way, sort of understand the meaning of what I'm doing. And part of that is sort of getting back to the roots of humanity mm -hmm. and what it is. Not only I try to do in the classroom, but also what I try to do in the communities that surround me, mm -hmm. that I both live in, teach in, do service in. And that's how we that's how we connected. That's how we connected. That's with how what we connected. Yes. It's pretty remarkable because I know that this is the signature, which I don't know if anyone can see that. Yeah. It's, is it's a hand. hand. Yep. Explain, explain to me why. The yeah. Hand. Well, when when Project Humanity started, it, Project Humanities is an initiative. We call it an initiative. What that means is it's not a department, it is not a school, but it is something that permeates the whole university. And it means that we don't have faculty, we don't have students, but what we have are creative ideas and people who want to bring uh, individuals and communities together to do three things, talk, listen, and connect. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of TLC, we call it, I okay? And, and in order to sort of um, brand the project, we needed a logo. And the logo became this hand. And the hand comes uh, vaguely from Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, uh, right after the emancipation of the enslaved, and it says, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand. And that's what that is. It's several people moving in a direction, not the Thanksgiving turkey hand. Right. But it's it's also right here, as people may see. And, and the idea is that there's movement there. And I like the operative word that we can be. It doesn't say we have to be, but we can. And I like that element of choice Everything there. Everything is a choice. Everything is a choice. Totally is a choice. Everything is a choice. Now we looked back here at this, yes. but now we have this mannequin back here. Please explain. Well, that's, that's our model. Oh. That's our model. The model's, so the model's name is Pat. Pat. And a student, Pat, uh, came up with the logo for our Hacks for Humanity. We, we try to look at humanity through the lens of seven principles. Uh, compassion, empathy, forgiveness, kindness, um, self-reflection, um, and I'm probably forgetting two others. Uh, but, but the idea is how do we live our lives in ways that practice these principles, integrity. Um, and so we combine that with technology in this event, which is every fall, and it's not just for techies. It really is an opportunity for people who do technology, but also for people who don't do technology. We think that community building comes when people come with their own skill sets and their own special talents and then create something whole, therefore the hand, separate as the fingers, each a separate discipline, a separate, you know, sometimes different generations, uh, different communities, different professions, but you come together 
together and you create a technology that is somehow for the common good. And that common good can be anything from a suicide prevention app to a technology that allows parents of children with ADHD to communicate more effectively. Or another one that was in one of our recent uh, hackathons had to do with uh, a technology that buzzes uh, in the pocket of someone who may not be able to hear uh, when there are emergency vehicles around. I didn't think about that. Well, especially during the day. At night, you could see those lights, but imagine during the day, wow. we are able to see yeah. uh, and hear, yeah. but there are many people who can see but can't hear those. So this thing starts to buzz. That's what comes out of bringing people together um, and demonstrating empathy, but also being able to respect that difference is okay. It doesn't have to mean that people are less valued. I always say just because something different happened to you doesn't mean you have to be different or act yes, different. Yes, yes. But yet we do when certain things happen to us. Right. And, and you talk about the buzzer in the pocket. I yes. actually um, sat down with a gentleman who is blind. Yes. He became blind at the age of 28, and he's about my age, right. young, 50. <laughs> and he showed me on his phone how he uses it. Yes. And that was amazing. Yes. So well, the technology is there. I just... Well, and, and what's interesting about this, I think, and this is my own bias, is that often we relegate those kinds of conversations and actions to people in technology. But, but what I'm finding more and more, this will be our seventh year doing it in October, October 11th and 12th, so Saturday, Sunday, 36 hours. You don't have to be in technology in order to do it. In fact, we want people both inside and outside technology because we need everybody. You learn how to pitch, you learn how to do a business plan, you learn how to do research, you learn how to ask the questions about audience. All of that comes together and there's a piece for everybody. And what we like about this event is that people come in not with a challenge given to them, they don't come in with the prepackaged team, they come in, they form a team, they come up with a challenge based on some loose guidelines that we give them, and by the end of 36 hours, they have learned all this stuff, but more importantly, they've connected with people that they ordinarily wouldn't connect with. The humanities they part. have connected with that, and that what that means is that they've shown vulnerability, and they realize that it takes a team of people to accomplish stuff. That's with anything. That's with anything. And you know, um, I had seen your PBS special when it talked about is humanities really there? Yes. There people being disconnected because we have yeah. electronic devices yeah. that are getting our attention more than the the face-to-face -face right. time that people should be taking, right. so they're disconnecting. Right. So it sounds as though this humanities thing is bringing that back, but still having an idea to the real life that's going on. Well, I, I guess what, I, what I, I would reframe it slightly differently. I would say that we, what humanities tries to do is to bring things together mm -hmm. and not think of things in terms of either or, okay. because technology has actually brought some humanity. It's the it's 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 the way in which you know we use technology to bring people together. Technology has created social movements across the world. Technology has allowed people's lives to be saved. You know, so I the technology in and of itself is not the the culprit, it's how the technology is used. And too often what we found is that people who know how to do the technology don't imagine the human part to that. And I have that's to, what's missing thank you from for that. Rephrasing that because actually now that I think about it, there are people who don't come out of their homes. Yes. That the that the internet is all that they have. And they connect and with they people all over the world for, for one reason or another. Or they yes. do. You're right. They do connect. So the technology. The potential is there. Definitely. And just like there's there there. Um, what do we call unintended consequences okay. for many things. Okay. The same thing can happen with technology, but I think of the ways in which technology has saved people. And so we, we don't want to, I don't want to do this to sort of throw it out and assume, and I know that's easy to do because it makes it neater for us to imagine that technology is the culprit, uh, but technology helps us in many ways. But it's, it's the same way we've had any advancement. We have to look at the unintended consequences. Okay. That's what this does though. But you know, even, even beyond the products that come out of this, it's the fact that people have made connections. They've talked, they've listened, they've connected. And it's also, they've had fun doing it. Okay. And imagining that this is something bigger than, you know, can I find my car in a parking structure? I know that can be life altering, but it doesn't have to be an existential moment. I've lost my car. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the world didn't me. end. But the world didn't end. This is something that really is about fundamentals about humanity. And, you know, as we prepare for the fall, we have anywhere from 150 to 200 people coming together for that weekend. We feed people. We have games. We have therapy dogs. We have meditation and yoga. We have a midnight disco, line dancing. 
and they're also doing things for something that is bigger than we are individually. And it's also something that they and I couldn't do without somebody else. So it shows you that it doesn't mean we, we can't, can't do it by ourselves. It, it, it means that we certainly can't create that by themselves. And so the collaboration, one of the cliches that I use now is that no success without collaboration. And it's exactly why I come weekly to fans because I know that even the work that we do with our homeless outreach is not something that we can do by ourselves. And collaboration is huge. Absolutely. For Absolutely. I was talking to a gentleman down in Tucson and, and uh, you know, the word community is misused so much and mm -hmm. when I think of community it's your neighbor next door mm -hmm. it's someone like yourself who comes in and, and works with us or we work with you and then you're back out there helping other mm -hmm. people it's a constant exchange mm -hmm. in your hand it is yes. and, and we thought we thought the, the hand would be better than just sort of people shaking hands Absolutely. and we thought that if we could you know and it does have that kind of Thanksgiving turkey hand that many of us drew when we were small mm -hmm. but we added more people to it and it's all about moving in a direction it doesn't mean you can't do anything with a finger it just means Look at what the possibilities are when we bring the other fingers together. So we talk about community. There's mm -hmm. one other thing I know that you do, and you actually are out there with the homeless. Mm -hmm. So not only are you just a professor here teaching a class, which mm -hmm. what I understand is probably nowhere near part of the curriculum of getting a job, but Correct. something that we actually should be in touch with society Correct. because once we get out there, we right. lose touch because life happens. Well, th that's one of the things that I've tried to address as uh, a faculty member who also sees himself as someone deeply committed and embedded in communities, multiple communities. And the homeless outreach has sort of taken my lifelong learning to a whole different level. I mean, there are ways in which we can have intellectual conversations about X, Y, and Z, sure. but intellectual uh, conversations can also exclude people. You know, we have people with high IQs, we have people who don't understand, but there's something about a human connection that is hard to exclude people from. And so this, this homeless outreach has been eye-opening, but it's also been a way of bringing people together who have, first of all, had myths and uh, misunderstandings about people experiencing homelessness. Uh, Even the way we talk about it, you know, everybody is mentally ill or, or people are just throwing trash around it. And there's, you know, or, or the one I hear most often is teach people how to fish instead of giving them fish. And I'm just so, might, st I'm stunned by that. That might have been something a long time ago, but things have evolved so differently. And, you know, the homeless, like you said, there's a stigma on it. Yes. And I had to have a conversation with a, an older lady than myself not mm -hmm. too long ago. She's like, well, you know, if they would just get a job. Well, not everyone's capable of getting a job. <laughs> and so I asked her, I said, have you ever volunteered? And she's like, no, why would See? I do that? And right. I said, let me, let me walk you through right. how that might give you a different right. mindset. Right. Because I also go down to St. Vincent and yep. the main, and I, on the yep. main holidays. And I help mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. feeding the homeless. Yep. And it's not feeling sorry for them. I'm going, that could be me. That could be right. anybody I know. Well, and the, the, the fact that it's not only that, but yes, it, 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 although it may seem that we're sitting here right now, you know, often what happens is people don't have a support system. And if that support system leaves, then sometimes you have nothing. And I'm looking at the cost of housing now, affordable housing. This is not people who are lazy. And, and, and I can say with certainty that the people we support are not there because they're going to get a, a, you know, travel size tube of toothpaste. They're going to sleep on the floor for that. It, right. That just makes no sense. And what, what I'm hoping that we're able to do is to do these collaborative. So it's not just collaboration because we need a, an army of volunteers there helping with our distribution of clothing, toiletries, and shoes. We don't do food. Now, if we do food, it's, it's, it's a granola bar. It's not like we're doing yeah. grits and bacon and all those kinds of things that really aren't transportable. You know, a lot of well-meaning people come down and they, they want to hand out these hot meals, but that's not the circumstance that people are always in. So I have learned, and that's actually how our started. I was going down with, um, with my church group. It was a men's group doing an annual thing. And I was standing in line, you know, giving out fruit. And somebody said, oh, I wish I had a pair of socks. And I thought, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start a clothing corner. So we started with tarps on the ground and we had, you know, the men's on one side and the women's on one side. And even though clothing is not always gendered, that's how people were asking for them. Mm -hmm. And then and then it took somebody else saying and we were climbing around on the tarp and everything, you know, giving people what they wanted. And there was a system there. So it wasn't just this big free for all where people were diving into clothes that to me can be dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. We were personal shoppers yeah. for the individuals who came and they lined up. 
They went in to the marketplace, they shopped, got their six items, and then they exited. But I think what was most important, at least for me, is that we said, good morning, what's your name? My name is Neil. How can we help the you this morning? The part that people forget. It's the one-on-one. -on -one. It's important. The it's humanity the, part. The humanity part. You know, <laughs> Imagine that. And, and it's so simple, yet right. people feel like they're, they're distancing themselves for, I don't right. know, personal reasons, or, you know, we've right. got this coronavirus thing. Right. It's like, well, no one wants to touch anyone anymore right. because we're not sure what we're, right. what we're going to do. Right. Um, you know, we talked about um, the different things that you're doing and the homelessness. We put the stereotype. Mm -hmm. Someone could have lost, like myself, could have lost a, a member of their family, and that tears the family apart, and now that divides mm -hmm. in so many different directions, too, because I know I was affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, with your projects that you do with mm -hmm. the homeless. Mm -hmm. How can anyone get involved here if well, they want? Well, that's interesting because we, we go down every other Saturday and it's anywhere from 15 to when Michigan State's Alumni Association, thanks Michigan State <laughs> Alumni Association, that make it part of their annual global outreach. Um, we do that every other Saturday from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and people I know will say that's so early I can't get up and I keep thinking well housing insecurity and hunger are not necessarily on schedule so like imagine that you get to go back to your warm bed and your warm house and and many of our clients don't have that option like so that's one thing but I also say that you don't also have to come we sort every Friday from two to four at a warehouse here in Tempe uh, all of those details are on our website Project Humanities .asu .edu, under Service Saturdays. What started off as spontaneous, we've made it regular for five years now. And if you can't come down to either of those, then you can always do a drive. You can do a backpack drive, do a deodorant drive, do a razor drive, do a shampoo and conditioner drive, just among yourself, or just clean out your closet. And let us know, and we'll figure out how to do that. Yeah. So this is not something that excludes anybody. And I think that's what's been exciting about it. Sometimes people can't get into a class. Sometimes people aren't making the grades they want in a class. This is something everyone can do, and we're not evaluating people on it. Yeah. Volunteering is so important yes. no matter where you are, right. what you do, what it's for. And very good for our well-being, too. Just did a presentation on that. It feels good. Uh, it, you, you, it, it allows us to make connections, to build communities that we other, and you know the other thing that it does is it, it takes us off of whatever may be um, weighing us down. And that can be extremely important uh, for whatever we have. And, and everybody always needs some, somebody always needs something. And if it's just a smile or just a good morning, how are you, tell me what you're doing. I had somebody come down who was going through the line and she said, you know, I thought you had to be rich to have a personal shopper. And I'm like, nope, we're your personal shoppers here. And again, we're not throwing things at people. You know, I've also learned that, you know, I go down, I do this, I've been doing it for five years. People, first of all, think it's a ministry. And it's not a, it's not a ministry that's based in faith. It is a faith based in our humanity, not, not any sort of other uh, organized traditional religion. organized religion. Yeah. So they're first surprised at that. Then they think it's Arizona State University. I said, no, this is community-wide. So we have high school students, we have middle school students, we have Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, fraternities, sororities, church groups. We have everybody out there. And the issue is that you can't tell that when we're doing it. And that's what we mean by people coming together toward one cause. It doesn't matter what your political alignment is. It doesn't matter whatever you've brought to it. We leave it there. Right. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity to not only um, receive humanity back, but also to give and to see that this really isn't about an identity. Housing insecurity and homelessness is about a circumstance. Absolutely it is. And I tell everyone, I always say, it's even on my voicemail, Make a difference, one person, one day at a time, because that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Just one person, just like your hand. Yep. There's a bunch of people here. Yep. It's one hand coming together. All right. so, thank you, Dr. Lester. So the last question I love asking, oh my. and a lot of people don't even realize this question, but I know that I'm living mine. What legacy, when your days are done, do you want to be remembered for? Well, I, I remember there's a gospel song that my dad always liked. My dad was a preacher, and... Um, it's actually by the Consolers, which is a husband-wife team, and I heard them when, when they were older, so they were an older uh, couple, and they had a line in a song that says, May the life I live speak for me. So I would like not necessarily to write my own script, but hope that I've lived a life where the script that is written for me speaks to what I've tried to give to society rather than what I've tried to take. So may the life I live speak for me. 
and in the communities that you are in, that definitely does speak, Dr. Lester. Thank you for your You're very time. welcome. Thank you for your time and for your interest in more about Project Humanity. And thank you also for the support that you've given us, both as um, a, a, a person who comes to our, our events, but also as someone who has been one of our table facilitators, because we appreciate the expertise of everyone. And thank you also. The, fundamentally, what you're doing is humanities. Storytelling is about humanities. And I fundamentally believe that we as humanists, as people who study the sort of academic part of this, if we did it and then named it, then we would have a lot more people supporting it. And I think that's what this is, is we're sharing a story. And the story is about other people. It's not just about us. It's not. You know what? It's not about us. It's about everyone else that's around us. And yes. I, I say this to everybody. Not everyone's going to write a book or their right. story is going right. to be on the headline news. And it's not going to be on the right. cover of a magazine. And not mm -hmm. everyone's going to be famous. Right. But everyone has something they can share with one another. Absolutely. Whether it's coming together. Yes. Or someone who's sitting there that doesn't have anybody else. But this is, they're coming together. Yes. So, yeah. It's, I guess I am doing yeah. an act of humanity. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm intrigued by people. Well, and stories. That's, that's so fundamental to our humanness <laughs> and the ways in which we document our lives yeah. and the ways in which we interact. And, you know, I say this at, when I'm telling, I, I do a, a presentation on telling stories um, in ways that many uh, uh, African Americans, for example, in this country and women were denied access to, to reading and writing. But people could talk and tell stories and created themselves, even in spaces that they were denied access to what we call alphabet literacy, being able to read and write. That was dangerous. And, but telling the story, though, and the fact that the stories can live on. Get, the stories live on, and they yes. are they, some, get, some stories get changed. Well, that's true. Well, that's, that's, but that's, that's what's exciting to me about orality, too. I mean, I think about songs that I sing in the car, and I don't know the words to them. <laughs> and then, and then when, I, and when I see the lyrics, I'm like, oh, so that's what that says. <laughs> so. But that's part of our humanity, too. And then, and then we may never know what the lyrics are, right. because that's what we've learned, but we can also unlearn that. Right. And that to me is that humanity doesn't mean that one has to be perfect, that one has to show a certain kind of vulnerability and a certain willingness to sort of learn from whatever mistakes we may see. And, and shortfalls and disappointments and losses and all those things is how do we continue to live in a spirit that is hopeful and a spirit that brings something to the world that doesn't just take it out. You talk about spirit and you talk about the stories. That eulogy everyone talks about, if you look at a headstone, it doesn't give the story, it just gives the date you right. were born and the day that you passed away. Right. Your eulogy is the stories, which right. is what I ask, right. what legacy do you want to leave? And some people go, legacy? These are. This is your story and those that know you, mm -hmm. however indirect mm -hmm. or direct, will be able to share and right. say, I remember this person. Right. So, well, then I think we can write our stories um, and still have them not remember the way we would want them. So yeah, I hope that I'm, yeah. I hope that I live in such a way that people remember not just the good, but that this was somebody who was always trying to be better and trying to do better. I because I, that, because yeah. I certainly don't want anybody to think that I was trying to embody perfection. Oh no, so. you know, that's a word I don't even believe. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, in, the, it's in the dictionary <laughs> and that's about all I use for But I don't know word. anybody who gets. <laughs> <laughs> for our worst critics. Right. Again, thank you so much. No, thank it was, you. It uh, was very opening to hear, uh, opening and heart touching to hear more about who you are versus just the exchange of time that's very short when we do cross yes. paths. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the work that you're doing and thank you for having me on the show. As I always say, keep coming back because these just keep getting better and better. I have some coming up, but you'll have to come back and see them. So until next time, you take care.